Xenoblade 3 commences the end of an era, the resolution of a narrative and the conclusion of the trilogy. Regardless, even with the story at its climax, there are still many questions left unanswered. Whether we're considering the implications resulting from Origin or the genesis of Mobius, the truth may remain unclear, but there is always an explanation to eradicate the unknown. By the end of this video, you will understand the Black Fog in its entirety, how the Annihilation Effect works and how Nopon reproduce. So let's get started. So by examining the fog, we can break it down and see that it has three fundamental properties that compose the substance. 1. The fog is sentient, or perhaps a better word would be autonomous, in that the fog can detect and move towards beings like Mobius. 2. The fog is a precognition, or it in fact triggers the annihilation events through means I'll explain later. Finally, 3. The fog is a type of wave or signal that can interfere and disturb the irises and sight of the Mobiuses. These three factors all serve one simple purpose, which is to correct the supernatural beings or contradictions predictions to reality that exist within the world. Putting it another way, the fog is the universe's janitor, entering different worlds and cleaning up things that aren't supposed to exist there by the will of a higher power. In the context of Xenoblade 3, this pertains to the Mobius who have frozen Ionios in an everlasting now, breaching the rules of causality and interfering with how reality should be, which in tandem summoned the fog and initiated the cleanup process. This isn't the only example in the Xenoblade universe either, as the Fog King is likely another example of the same process. Other than the obvious visual similarities, both are working towards the same goal, which in future connected scenario is the removal of Zanza's corpse from the Xenoblade 1 universe. Zanza was a being similar to Mobius who controlled and manipulated the rules of the world to his own selfish desires, even similarly putting time in a loop as demonstrated through Albus describing the world as stagnant. Even even so, the events of Xenoblade 1 actually take place within Alvis's memory space, an ability he possesses due to him being part of the Trinity Processor. Zanza is then defeated, and the world begins its collapse, sending us back to the real, present universe, where the absence of any being connected to the conduit now activates the fog, which then seeks to clean up and dispose of Zanza's remains. Those remains, referring to the surviving Telethia, who are stated to be mere cells from Zanza's body and are gathered in large quantity within Alchemoth. These concepts also parallel Xenosaga's Gnosis and Collective Unconscience, regarding how these higher domain beings enter a lower domain to remove any imperfections that exist there. The Fog King is the equivalent to the Gnosis, maintaining a level of intelligence and having the ability to corrupt other living beings, whereas the Black Fog is closer to the Collective Unconscience, in that it can be used and tasked to follow commands, which have been set by someone or something else. And if you're unconvinced that this parallel has any validity at all, I would like to draw your attention to Xenoblade 3, which is basically the Xenogears HD remake that you've all been waiting for for so long. So it isn't above Takahashi to reference something like this. Due to the autonomous behaviours, the Black Fog also seems to congregate in Mobius hotspots where there is lots of activity, an example of the fog being attracted to those who do not belong in this world. This is proven as early as Chapter 2, where we see the before and after of the area surrounding Colony 4, when Console K is and isn't present. Within the short time he is stationed there, the fog goes from being dispersed all over the wilderness to gathered all in one location, interfering and seeking the Mobius. Alone, this may have just been a coincidence, but the fog is also present en masse around the castles, the home bases of Console's N and M, as well as being seen moving towards P and O when exceeding their interlink timer. In fact, Ionius itself is also a target for the fog, as can be seen when the correct conditions are met. If you stand in high up locations with clear weather and look out towards the horizon, you will notice that the surrounding ocean and world is intact whereas everything else within the proximity of Origin and Ionios has been wrecked due to the fog being gathered around this area, triggering annihilation events more regularly in an attempt to eradicate the parasites. Speaking of which, to understand how the annihilation events work, we first need to take a look at some real world physics in terms of the concept of antimatter. Put simply, matter and antimatter are collections of particles which have the same mass but opposite electric charge. Matter is composed of protons 
protons, which have a positive charge, whilst antimatter is composed of antiprotons, which have a negative charge. When matter and antimatter collide, they cancel one another out, destroying each other and resulting in a large release of energy. In this sense, we can liken Xenoblade 2's old rest to being a world made up of positive energy and Xenoblade 1's universe being a world of negative energy. The worlds possessing opposite charges are then what lead to the two moving towards one another, similar to how magnets attract. If the two worlds were then ever to intercept, they would similarly, simply, cancel one another out, initiating a universe-wide annihilation event, being the equivalent to the release of energy. This is even stated and explained by Nia here. However, the worlds yearned for each other. Against the solitude of existence, they strove to reunite. Though it would spell certain destruction, should the two worlds intersect, they would cancel each other out and cease to be, leaving only light. Due to the will of Mobius freezing time, moments before the two were perfectly overlapped however, the annihilation event was perpetually delayed, and the worlds were held in stasis. This is also why Ionios itself and many areas within are suspended in mid-air, being supported by nothing. In technicality, these areas are actually falling, but due to time being frozen in place, they remain where they are. This then raises a question that you're all probably wondering about as well. If time is frozen, and the worlds are held in place moments before both fully intercept with one another, then how are the smaller annihilation events of Ionios triggered? Well, the answer is rather simple. The black fog can interfere with and remove the time freeze that is placed all over Ionios. If you think about it, time being frozen isn't a natural phenomenon, and so it's conceivable that the fog would detect and attempt to return things to normal by restarting the flow of time. Doing so would then trigger an annihilation event, albeit on a much smaller scale due to the pressure of the time freeze. Think of it like blowing up a bomb underneath the water. The pressure from the water would push and fight back against the growing explosion until eventually the pressure wins out and returns the disturbance to normal. The annihilator cannons also work on the same principles, with the only difference being that they artificially create the annihilation events. This is through them gathering and storing the black fog after immobilizing and deactivating it, as can be seen surrounding the Cavessian castle and within Erythia Sea, located below the Agnian castle, and is the reason why annihilation events don't occur here. When charging the weapon, the fog is absorbed inside of the castle, creating an annihilation event within the barrel which is then reproduced at the target location. The excess fog is then fired out of the front, similar to how old school real world guns remove excess gunpowder. The result is a blast of energy that triggers an annihilation event, eradicating the target Target via the natural process of the merging that we went over earlier. The Black Fog's effects are not simply limited to the creation of annihilation events however, as it has been proven to have other more passive properties, one of which we touched upon earlier which is obscuring the vision of Mobius. Witnessed from Kay's perspective, we can see how the fog completely blocks and prevents the Mobius from perceiving anything through it. A detailed explanation of how this works will be included in my Explaining Mobius video, but to simplify it for the purposes of this one, the fog acts similar to a filter, preventing the signals that Mobius require to see from reaching their irises. It also possesses some form of wave that interferes with other signals. The exact type is unknown, but the fog has the ability to temporarily sever the connection between the irises of ordinary people, shown when Noah is unable to send out a call during the battle at Alfetto Valley. By interfering in this way, the Mobius could lose control of the world via them being unable to maintain the balance, ending the eternal now and restarting time, leading to the destruction of everything, which to the fog is just another way of resetting things back to normal. And with that all concluded, that just leaves one more question that needs to be answered. How do Nopon reproduce? This has stumped scientists for years, as these fluff balls have seemingly kept on popping up everywhere throughout all of time and space for no conceivable reason, but today, I have an answer. It turns out the Nopon are actually similar to plants, and are grown from tiny seeds, which forms a Nopon tree. The Nopon tree sprouts fruit named Bright Figs, which eventually develop, ripen and grow into baby Nopon. This also confirms something else we've been wondering about for a while. 
Not on a fucking cannibals. And on that note, it's time to end this video. I hope you found this video informative and it's helped you to come to understand the purpose and truth behind the fog in Xenoblade 3. If it has, I'd appreciate if you'd click that subscribe button and notification bell, as it helps me and the channel out a ton to get these videos out to other fellow Xenoblade fans. I appreciate you all for watching though and hope to catch you in the next one. This is JB, signing off.